Good morning, everyone. This is 11 o'clock. We're almost ready to start. We'll give it, I would say, 30 seconds or more as we get our cameras on um, and sort of bring everyone to the party here today. We're going to be talking about a lot of very, very interesting, very complicated, absolutely crazy stuff today um, in terms of the crypto asset landscape in the UK. So we're looking forward to the session. Um, we'll give it another sort of 20 seconds or so, and then we'll get started with some introductions. All right. I think that's been about 20 seconds or so. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome today to our session. Um, I'm Jess Kath, Head of Financial Crime at Thistle Initiatives. Um, and today we're going to be talking about decrypting the UK crypto asset landscape. Um, this is obviously hosted by us at Thistle, but also Fox Williams and an incredible crypto uh, sort of independent compliance consultant here as well today. Um, so today we're going to cover quite a lot the landscape is very messy, so we're going to go on an, a real journey today. Um, but before we do that, perhaps a little introduction to the speakers um, as well. So a little background for myself. Obviously, I'm the head of financial crime here at Thistle. So we deal with everything in terms of financial crime prevention, AML, ABC, sanctions. Uh, there's lots of crazy things at the moment. But of course, crypto falls into my space in the UK because the crypto asset registration process is for money laundering oversight. Um, so of course, a lot of the, the piece that you have to put together when going through that process is building up a super strong financial crime framework. Um, and then Thistle Initiatives itself, we're a specialist governance risk and compliance consultancy. We've been helping firms with weird and wonderful challenges for around 10 years now. Um, and we've got a whole load of sort of expert consultants to guide you through a lot of sort of authorization processes, lots of ongoing advice and support, um, and a lot of different things. So anything regulatory compliance and financial crime related, we can help and support. But definitely enough about me, perhaps, um, Mardi, do you want to introduce yourself and Fox Williams? Great. Thanks, Jess. So my name is Marty McGregor and I'm a regulatory partner at Fox Williams. Um, I've got quite a broad advisory regulatory practice, including things like banking, insurance, investment services. But I've got a specialist intro in crypto, electronic money and payments. So I do a lot of kind of crypto and payments work. Um, Fox Williams is a full service business law firm. We've got around 50 partners in the city of London and we do everything you'd normally expect from a city law firm like corporate employment, IP tax, that kind of thing. Um, but we've three kind of specialist areas of strategic focus. The first of those is partnerships and professional services, which I think is probably not super relevant here. But the other two are tech and financial services. So as you'd expect, we've got a really large and well-developed fintech team um, and quite a lot of regulatory lawyers within that team. So yeah, that's us. Um, and actually, we also work a lot with Thistle um, on some of their projects. So great to be here. You do indeed. Yes, that's a lot of scope, but uh, very interesting work you do there. Um, Lynn, over to you as well. And also, it's such incredible space to have three female speakers talking about crypto. So it's so different to all of the normal panels. But Lynn, maybe a little bit of background on your side as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a compliance officer. I've been in the compliance space for more than 10 years. I'm also a former UK regulator, and I've spent the last uh, five years with uh, crypto compliance, including with a very large um, uh, cryptocurrency exchange uh, globally, both in the UK and overseas, and uh, also more recently with the Digital Merchant Bank. So I look forward to uh, our session today. Perfect. So we've got consultant, we've got legal, we've got practical insights. So we should be able to cover a lot of bases here today. Um, so that's what we're going to try and do, actually. Through the whole session, we're really going to provide, hopefully, invaluable insights, but also uh, practical strategies as well to try and begin to navigate through this weird and wonderful crypto uh, landscape in the UK. Um, so perhaps if we sort of move to the next slide and I'll walk you through the journey that we're going to try and go on today. We've only got an hour and we've got a lot to cover. Um, so we're going to start by attempting to set the tone of what's going on. So um, looking at what's happening with the UK government and then of course what's going on at the regulator. And there's a 
of quite often two very different things happening between these two. So we're going to set the tone first and foremost, but not we're not going to spend too much time on the tone. We're then going to talk about the practical pieces. So what exactly is the UK regulatory framework for crypto assets will be part two. Um, and then we'll go into the actual crypto asset registration process um, in the UK. So how do you establish whether or not you fit within scope? And once you've done that, then number four, we're going to talk through how to actually navigate that registration process and give you some practical insights. And then we're going to finish and wrap up with hopefully some top tips. Um, and we'll see whether or not we've got time for a Q&A, but please make sure we are putting questions into the Q&A box. Um, depending on how you've set up your Zoom, it'll either be at the top or bottom of your screen. So make sure you put any questions into the Q&A. Um, I will try to weave them throughout the session. Um, and yeah, I'll try my best at whatever the appropriate point is, I'll weave the questions in between. Uh, but yeah, please do throw them in. If we don't get time to answer them today, we'll, we'll perhaps try and answer them after the session as well. Uh, quick note as well, please don't use the chat function for your questions because we won't uh, monitor that too much. Uh, so put it in the Q&A box for your questions. Okay, that's definitely enough from me. Uh, we'll probably turn off the slides now so you can hopefully see our excellent faces. Uh, marvellous, we're nice and big on the screen now. Um, and we'll start with the, the session today. So to start with, the tone in the UK is a little bit mental. So let's explore this in a little bit more detail. So there are a few competing priorities when it comes to the tone the government's setting and then also the tone that the regulator is actually following. And I wonder, Mardi, could you sort of start us off here? What are we seeing and how how, how is this problematic? Yeah, so I think very generally the, gl the global trend is that the regulation of cryptocurrency is increasing. Um, in the UK, we've had a lot of rhetoric um, from the government, from the Treasury, um, and, and that rhetoric has been really positive. It's been kind of setting the UK up as, as um, a great place for innovative business, um, and it's been really kind of crypto positive rhetoric. But I think on the other hand, the FCA seems seems very crypto sceptic um, and you know the two seem to be quite disjointed I think the reality is that is that the UK is now somewhat behind the EU um, I'm hopeful that in the medium to long term the UK can hopefully watch the U EU's implementation of Mika and maybe pick and choose the bits that work and then the bits that don't work but I think the reality is that in the short term businesses are craving the greater certainty that's needed to help them plan and sustainably grow and develop their businesses and whilst we you know until we see the legislation come through from the government and the treasury and um, the fca is kind of left to to kind of take it sort of crypto skeptic approach mm -hmm. yeah I, we i completely agree with that point we've got quite a good relationship with the uk department of business and trade and they're trying to encourage businesses to come across to the uk and set up here establish you know good crypto businesses but quite often the process they have to go through with the FCA is very, very tricky. And we'll explore that in more detail. Um, I mean, Lynn, have you got any sort of, from your practitioner's perspective, any insights that you're seeing on the ground at the moment in terms of the tone we're seeing from the government, but also then what's actually happening with the FCA? Well, um, I think we have to step back and talk about what the UK government did when they first set up the regulation, which is they responded to the global standard setting body, the FATF, to set up an initial process to regulate um, under the money laundering regulations. So they created a base level registration process so that they could start to be compliant and in alignment with other international governments that also started their regulatory framework off the back of the money laundering standards. So there is a sort of a global alignment that we are uh, in the UK also trying to uh, you know, participate in. Um, that being said, the FCA does have a very strong mission to protect consumers and the anti-money laundering standards here in the UK are well known, well established and well respected. So it is a good jurisdiction from the standpoint of protecting uh, from uh, money laundering. Uh, so complying with that is really the key aspect of your application. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the session. But I don't think it's a bad thing that we are starting with the highest standards and the SCA is maintaining a very high bar. So they believe that they are in keeping with their principal mission 
And they, as you know, have added recently in October last year, the financial promotions regime on top of it to protect consumers in the area of advertising and financial promotions, mm -hmm. which is going beyond the advertising standards uh, agency, um, which has also been active in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point and touches on loads of the exciting things we're going to cover today. Um, but that's I mean, that's always the tricky part is getting the balance right here between having that protecting consumers focus, but also allowing innovation to grow and making sure that the UK stays sort of a really good fintech, uh, fast paced jurisdiction for, for new firms to sort of come here and, and set up either firms that are established in other perhaps Euro European jurisdictions or firms that are brand new and they're looking to set something up here. So it's getting that balance right. And I think the tone between what's going on in the government, of course, the FSA's absolute focus on maintaining exceptionally high standards and protecting consumers is, is tricky to get that balance right. Um, so basically, the tone here is challenging. It's challenging. Um, and the FCA is setting a really, really, really high bar when it terms when in terms of firms moving to the UK. So perhaps if we move on to section two, then, in terms of what the actual UK regulatory framework is. Um, so we've touched on a couple of things so far, but ultimately, we've got a bit of a patchwork. So as Lynn alluded to, we've got this crypto asset registration process uh, in line with the MLRs. Uh, we've got the financial promotions piece. We've got a separate regime being consulted on in terms of stable coins at the moment. So I'm going to turn to the legal expert. Mardi, do you want to just give us a sense of what is going on? What is the key sort of regulatory areas that we need to be aware of in the UK? Sure. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right that it is a bit of a patchwork. Um, and yeah, you've actually mentioned the sort of three key regulatory areas that I wanted to touch on. Um, the first of those is the AML registration process, um, which we've briefly spoken about. And I know we're going to come on to that in quite a bit more detail as the session progresses. So I'll set, I'll set that aside for, for a, a moment. Um, the second, um, as Lynn mentioned, is the new financial promotions restriction. Um, and that's, you know, a restriction on the promotion of qualifying crypto assets to UK consumers. And I think the kind of key point here is that this applies to anybody that wants to promote certain types of crypto assets to UK consumers. And that applies regardless of whether you're based in the UK or anywhere overseas. So it's, you know, the um, geographical scope of that rule is very, very broad. Um, under those rules, we're seeing the stricter regulation of advertisers. Um, so to be able to lawfully communicate a crypto asset promotion, you need to either be registered with the FCA under the money laundering regulations, which is that first point, the AML registration, um, or you need to be authorized authorized by the FCA, but that's that's quite difficult in the crypto context because we don't yet have a proper authorization regime for crypto. So you need to be authorized for something else that isn't crypto and then also wanting to kind of promote crypto. So that's that's a bit different, yeah. difficult. Um, another option is to have your promotion approved by a person that's already authorized. Um, and that's kind of interesting because there are risks there for, for people that are already authorized to start doing these approvals. Or there are some very limited exemptions, but it's important to note that the exemptions are not really in the retail space. So they're not really exemptions that are available if you're promoting to consumers. Mm. Um, and then, you know, within that, there's sort of stricter regulation of advertisements. You need to be sure that you're being fair, clear, not misleading. Um, and you need to make sure that you've got kind of appropriate risk warnings um, in all of your kind of crypto asset promotions. So that's that's an interesting point. And actually, um, yeah, we've started to see kind of a lot more regulatory work in this space since that um, financial promotion restriction came in. Um, I think this sort of third main thing, as you, as you touched on, Jess, is the upcoming changes um, to the regulated activities regime. So the Financial Services um, and Markets Act that came in in the middle of last year um, paved the way for both digital settlement assets or stable coins mm -hmm. and crypto assets generally to kind of move within the regulatory perimeter. So there's now provision in FISMA for, you know, for those things to be in the regulatory perimeter. 
Um, but what still needs to happen, so in the stablecoin space, the UK government is intending to bring in, um, make some changes to the payment services regulations um, so that um, fiat-backed stablecoins will become regulated in a similar way to you know, fiat currency at the moment. Um, and also the activities of issuing and custody of those stablecoins um, should fall within the existing regulatory perimeter once the regulated activities order is updated. And then in addition to the kind of stablecoin piece, there's the other crypto assets in general. So that's any asset right or interest that um, comprises or represents a crypto asset um, should subject to parliamentary time. And that's obviously a big one um, be incorporated within the re regulated activities order again, hopefully this year. Um, one of the important points here is that the FCA authorization won't automatically be granted to firms that are already registered under the AML regime. So it will be something that firms need to kind of think about and consider in action. So those are kind of the three main areas. There's lots of other things going on as well. So there's a consultation on the digital pound and um, there's a digital security sandbox um, and there's kind of lots of other smaller things going on. But I think as a, as a firm in the crypto space, those are kind of the the three main areas that you should be thinking about gosh that's a lot that's a lot yeah. to take in there um i think yeah of course we're going to come on to the registration process in more detail but the the stable coins piece is really interesting uh, because they are moving more into um fiat backed stable coins obviously as a kind of legitimate payment uh, process so that's going to be very very interesting there's also a few um, sort of challenges as to how they're going to set out maybe overseas issued GBP backed stable coins. So there's lots of interesting stuff that will be fleshed out as part of that regime for firms to be aware of. But that financial promotions piece is really key because this is already in place and a lot of firms are potentially not aware of it. The FCA expected a big flood of registrations post the financial promotions piece coming in, um, but they haven't necessarily seen that. And some firms have been looking to, can they get a third party firm in order to sign off their financial promotions for crypto? Um, and the we have seen some challenges here with some firms being you know, shut down very quickly. Have you got any other thoughts on whether or not firms get involved in this kind of third party sign off? Yeah, so I think third party firms should think very carefully before signing off crypto promotions. Um, I think you already alluded to this, but the FCA have already placed restrictions on an authorised firm to restrict it from approving crypto asset financial promotions. Um, and they've said really clearly that they're working with businesses, including social media platforms, app stores, search engines, etc., to remove or block illegal promotions. And they've actually issued, I think the last I read was 221 alerts since the regime went live. What we've seen from some of our clients is that actually some of them have just blocked the UK at the moment whilst they're whilst they're you know considering their options or, or you know applying for their AML registration and that works by they've just you know if as a UK consumer you try to access their website you basically just get a pop up that says mm -hmm you're in the UK, you can't see the con this content. Um, mm -hmm. And and so, um, you know, it's it's obviously not a great solution for those businesses because they'd like to access the UK market, but, it you know, it's taking them time to apply for their AML registration. But I think if you're a third party firm authorised for something else and you're thinking about signing off on crypto promotions, you need to do it carefully. You need to make sure that you've got the systems and controls and procedures in place to make sure that that activity, which might be a very nice way to make money, but to make sure that that activity doesn't contaminate or risk your kind of core authorized business. Yeah. Definitely. Very good. We're getting our top tips in early here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> turning to Lynn, then, you have worked in an insane number of jurisdictions across the UK and Europe. Um, what do, what are your sense on how the UK regulatory framework here compares to, I don't know, say France, for example? Um, well, uh, actually, I'd like to pick uh, Spain uh, as a good yeah. example in terms of uh, their uh consumer protection approach. Um, if you have a financial promotion in Spain, you have to submit it to the markets regulator uh, with 10 days in advance as a minimum requirement for their time to approve it. And then they have a government drafted disclaimer that has to be applied to all of the advertisements in Spain for crypto asset products. So they have already set up the actual steps that 
uh, a party that's going to advertise has to do in order to protect consumers. So they have done it that way. Here in the UK, uh, you know, if you have a financial promotion approved, um, then your individual promotion has to be drafted to provide the risk disclaimer, but it has to be specific to the risks of that product. It's not a generic disclaimer that's been already pre-drafted by the government, similar to an, a, a warning on a tobacco package, for example. So you're supposed to cover the specific risks of the specific product when you're discussing it and not just slap a general disclaimer on it from a financial promotions perspective. So when you're going into the uh, business of approving financial promotions, uh, promotions, you really have to have a very clearly uh, established risk management process for doing all the risk assessments of all of the products for all of the channels, understanding the risks of promoting in uh, mobile and web apps and on uh, bus stop ads and everything in between. So it's a, a very substantial step up in risk management processes and controls to become a financial promotions approver. Yeah, that's a really, really good comparison and um, goes back to our first point around the FCA just being that extra step up and the expectations being even more so compared to some of the other jurisdictions. Um, so I think we've been on a journey so far. So the, the the landscape is quite complicated. I suppose now if we start to drill down into some of the practical elements here. So if a firm wanted to go through um, the sort of crypto asset registration process, perhaps to align with the financial promotions requirements, um, how might they actually think about whether or not they need to go through that process? So how do you figure out whether or not you're in scope of this or not? Maybe, um, again, back to our legal perspective, Marty, could you give us a sense of what they need to start asking themselves in terms of questions? Yeah, so that's that's a that's a good question. And I think sort of one of the key points here is you can't just decide that you want to register with the FCA for AML purposes. You need to actually meet the legal definition. Um, and the requirement to register with the FCA applies to crypto asset exchange providers and custodian wallet providers, um, as well as to non-crypto businesses, which obviously we'll, we'll set aside because we're not interested in those today. Um, but the definition of a crypto asset exchange provider is very broad, and it includes firms that make arrangements with a view to the exchange of crypto assets for money or money for crypto assets or one crypto asset for another so it's you know that that's actually super broad and that will include firms that act as traditional exchanges firms that are you know trading platforms where buyers and sellers can interact but it will also include firms that just kind of um arrange commercial partnerships or or put you know, kind of various people in touch. So I think it's really important there to understand that this concept of exchange is actually very broad and includes kind of making arrangements with the view to exchange. Um, and then I think the other kind of key point is that the requirement to register only bites when the activity is carried on by way of business in the UK. And that's different from the financial promotions regime. So if, for example, you're a business based in Europe and you're thinking that you want to kind of market your product to UK consumers, you're not based in the UK, you're not you're not carrying on, you don't have kind of have people on the ground. Um, and so it's, you know, it's possible that even though you might want to register, because you might want to kind of use that to help you comply with your financial promotions piece, um, you might not technically meet the legal requirements for registration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting piece and because the definition is so, so broad, but there's lots of these edge cases. And in those cases, I always suggest they go and get a formal legal opinion because it can be very, very, very complicated trying to figure out where you sit. Um, and often your banking partners or anyone that you're dealing with, they don't necessarily understand whether or not you fit within the requirements or scope. And quite often we've seen firms yeah, the banking partner has said, go out and get that registration process. We won't deal with you if you don't go through the registration process. But actually, in some cases, they don't necessarily need to go through that. So really making sure it's clear and perhaps going and seeking a legal opinion can really, really help you to make sure you understand whether or not you're in or out of scope um, and can help you with your partners for sure. That's particularly important for uh, technology service providers 
you know, such is a, very a true. market data firm that's uh, providing just market data reporting, would they fall in or outside of the definition? You know, they would probably want to take legal advice, but very possibly might not need to be registered in order to market their services as a technology programming service provider, for example. That's most of the cases where they are, you know, more of a technology solution. Um, but as soon as they're doing something to do with blockchain or something to do with crypto, their banking partners might think, hang on a second, you are crypto-esque, therefore you must go through this new registration process. Um, so I absolutely agree with you. I mean, Lynn, from from your personal experience, and you've gone through a number of these different authorization um, regimes, how did you figure out whether or not any of your activities fell into scope? Well, you really need to take your uh, business plan and or any projected new product development and uh, take the regulation and line them up, literally. So what activities are you conducting now or planning to conduct? And do they fall into the definition of the uh, permissions that are uh, given for this particular type of registration? And are you going to be conducting that activity now or in the future or not? And it's really a lineup of product and um, activity of the firm versus the legally described uh, permissions and activities associated with the registration or licensing regime. In France, for example, they have two levels of uh, registration. One is just registering under the money laundering um, regulations. And then second of all, gives them further permissions to market individually to consumers, such as to send consumers individual emails. And for that, you have additional regulatory requirements to step up. And it's another second layer of regulatory review to achieve it. So different jurisdictions have different requirements. Mm -hmm. That's very that's very, very interesting. If you are working across multiple jurisdictions, just brace yourself um, and make sure you don't put one application pack across to another because there are going to be lots of different differences. They're going to you... have differences, yes. Yes, yeah. And no regulator likes to receive a cut and paste from another different regulatory entity. Um, okay, perhaps that actually is a quite a nice segue then, perhaps to start to explore the crypto asset registration process in a little bit more detail. So we've now kind of gone on a bit of a journey. We've started with the tone, then we've started to explore what the regulatory framework is and how you might start to assess whether or not you come into scope of that or not. Um, and now we'll talk a little bit about, okay, now you've decided that you are in scope, you've got your great legal opinion, what are the process steps? Um, but before I start this section, we have had uh, one question come in and I will try to deal with this question as part of this section. But um, if you do have any more questions, please do make sure you are putting them into the Q&A and we shall try to weave them in throughout this session. So a little bit about the crypto registration process itself then. So we, of course, support multiple firms through this process, more on the practical side. So helping with the documentation, supporting with the advice. Um, and it's very, very tricky process at the moment that almost in a way mirrors a full licensing uh, regime. Of course, this is just a registration process, but we are seeing it this almost similar to sort of tier one bank uh, licensing. It's a very, very complex, um, pretty intense process that you have to, to go through before you get approved. Um, and at a very, very super high level, this involves, of course, developing a really strong and clear regulatory business plan. Um, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail. And then of course you go away and you write a large suite of policies and procedures and your risk assessments and lots of documentation to support this. Um, and of course you build your tools and that kind of thing as well. Um, of course, you've got some forms that you need to fill in, the connect forms on the connect portal. Uh, you have an FCA case officer assigned, and then you begin a process of multiple question rounds, interviewing, um, preparing supplementary documentation, and lots of other things throughout this process. Um, and it can be much longer than you first think it's going to take because there will be lots of rounds of questioning and interviewing. Um, and there are a lot of things that you do have to put together throughout this process. Um, which are very tricky, particularly for new startups. I think one of the, the questions here is you have to put a lot of things into place before you get that approval. And it can be very expensive, like 
putting in a compliance officer um, and making sure you have perhaps got that external compliance support to build this pack. But it has to be super sharp, otherwise you're not going to get through this very, very high bar set by the FCA. So it's, it is very challenging to get the balance right between your brand new startup with limited funding sometimes versus actually getting through the approval process. Um, so we'll explore that in a little bit more detail here. So I've given a little bit of a summary, but Lynn, you're our practitioner here as well. So um, could you maybe break it down a little bit? And if we start with the business plan and perhaps the business risk assessment as well for financial crime, because these are pretty key failure points that the FCA is seeing at the moment. How did you start to put together your uh, business plan and of course the risk assessment um, and how much detail did you have to include in these documents? Well, first of all, you need to go to your business partners and survey the existing um, products completely um, and make sure you cover uh, everything that's in your systems. Uh, see if you have any trailing uh, risks of any kind and focus also on any new product approvals uh, that are you know, to be coming in the next six to nine months so that your presentation of the firm's activities is uh, complete and they can have a full risk assessment. Then you risk assess each of those products and you start to build your risk assessment for all of the uh, risks in the MLRs and, you know, and apply them to the various products and activities that you were conducting. Um, I've worked with firms that were doing arranging or planning on arranging. And so we spent some time on all the due diligence that we would do on the partners uh, in the arranging process, for example. Um, you also have to make sure, and this was going to be in my top tip, but I'll bring it up now. You have to benchmark um, all of the activities against all of the um, money laundering regulations. Your AML risk assessment has to cover every single MLR and if they don't, then the uh, risk assessment will be considered not satisfactory. So be very, very careful and benchmark against every MLR. Also go to the UK National Risk Assessment where proliferation financing was recently added as a national risk. So you have to add in proliferation financing as an additional risk to cover for all of your activities. Please to make sure that your risk assessment is full and complete. Um, then your regulatory business plan just has to cover all of the activities, including things like operational risk and making sure you have backup for uh, systems that could fail um, so that you're completely covered uh, at all times in terms of your product platform. And we'll be able to continue with your reg tools and use them for sanctions, uh, checking, et cetera all uh, has to be covered uh, as part of your plan. Uh, Marty, I don't know if you have other comments you might want to add in. No. The, re the, regu the regulatory business plan, I think. So just my thoughts on that before we come across to Marty as well. So yeah. the regulatory business plan is one that we quite often see firms struggle a little bit with because they've got this great idea um, and it comes out very much as kind of a, an engineering focused regulatory business plan. But the key here is that it's a regulatory business plan. It really needs to then set out what is the control framework, et cetera. Um, how are you building this as you're growing and scaling? Have you considered how your business is going to mature? Um, yeah. We often see quite overinflated plans as well. So you're going to become the next Coinbase in three years time when actually the FCA doesn't want to see that. They want to see a, a sensible plan with a clear sort of maturity framework that grows and scales alongside your business. So have you considered how many team members you're going to need in your compliance team as you keep growing? Um, have you considered how your volumes are going to look? Um, have you considered how your tooling is going to deal with those volumes? So that's the sort of thing that as we're dealing with firms when we're going through the regulatory business plan, we will be often pushing back and questioning to make sure that all of these are very clear and make sense. And then on the flip side, to your point, Lynn, the AML risk assessment has to be very sharp and consider all of the areas in lots of detail. 
Um, and the proliferation financing piece is a great shout out because, I mean, even we do a lot of auditing and assurance, and this is a key failure point. This came in in 2022, I think, and it's, it has been yes. around for about uh, a year and a bit, but a lot of firms have not put this into their risk assessments. Um, there are two ways of doing it. You either set out a separate proliferation financing risk assessment or you weave it into your existing risk assessment right. um, as a key right. area. And um, a lot of firms kind of avoid it because they think, hang on, I'm never going to be used for proliferation financing. You know, I'm not going to have anything to do with weaponry, that kind of thing. But ultimately, you need to be considering how might your product be used for some of these risks? And then how might we build a control to stop it if we were used for these risks? Now, I'm sure you wouldn't be, but who knows? And there are lots of interesting typologies through different crypto products where we are seeing some proliferation financing themes so it definitely is something to to keep in mind when you're building that out and of course when we have been submitting the risk assessments the fca have come back with questions that you must make sure you have really understood your um, every single activity you're doing which coins you're using um, all of the different ways in which your product is coming together need to be really fully fleshed out. We've seen the FCA go back and forth multiple times to look for more and more and more detail on this beyond what they were looking for two years ago. It's now very, very extreme. Just another point on the uh, Q&A, which uh, hasn't come up yet. Typically, a Q&A with a standard regulator would probably be, you know, three to four weeks of response time between submission of answers and a subsequent round of questions coming back. So you tend to have sort of a rhythm to this that can develop and you kind of become uh, able to expect when your supervisor will come back to you. And you can always ask uh, very politely, you know, what the timing could be. But uh, here in the UK, we have experienced some very, very long time frames, and particularly in the fintech community, um, some of the members of some of the industry associations have been reflecting back as a group that they are experiencing very long time frames, and I think that may have had to do with some of the supervision team staffing or authorization team staffing uh, at the regulator. So uh, just to let you know that these time frames here in the UK can be somewhat uh, longer than what you might experience in some other countries or with regulatory teams that are staffed uh, more for authorization in other countries. Uh, and I, I guess, so my perspective on this is sometimes um, you need to assume that the person at the FCA who is reviewing your application is you know, intelligent and literate, but doesn't necessarily have the kind of technical knowledge and background that you have. Um, and, and you know, you kind of need to almost spoon feed them and make the information as kind of easy to access and follow as possible. One of the things that we find with the AML registration process, but also with any other kind of authorization process is once the case officer starts to ask questions, they keep going and they, you know, once they, you know, once they find a few pieces that they that don't make sense or that they can't quite follow or, you know, that the answer is in a sort of different part of the application and it's not been kind of clearly signposted and they can of get into the role of asking these questions they sometimes keep going and it's difficult to get them to stop and i think you're absolutely right lynn that um you know that they've they've struggled with capacity at the fca and so when they're asking you a question the time frame for consideration is postponed and so they can sometimes use it as a as a tactic to kind of give themselves more time to consider because they've got so many applications. So I think um, whilst um, for the technical people that are drafting these business plans, that can be really frustrating because so much of the terminology is really obvious to them. Um, you know, you kind of need to kind of take the reader through it step by step so that it makes sense to somebody who's really approaching it cold and who doesn't necessarily have the kind of same technical technical background. Um, and I think Jess is absolutely right. Um, it also can't be too optimistic. Um, the assumptions that you're relying on for your projections need to be really clear. And if they are too optimistic, then you can expect challenge from the regulator. Mm -hmm. Very good yeah. points. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Although I think we have, I've had a few sort of insights recently that the capacity may be improving a little bit. Um, yeah, right. And maybe we might start to see some faster movements in terms of how 
you know, quick the FCA is to respond. But again, time will only tell because at the moment, I would say the end to end uh, registration process is is a year at the moment minimum um, at least yeah. at least yeah at least in terms of going back and forth for questioning as you said Mardi, really understanding the product um, and of course if your case manager changes throughout the process you've got to start from scratch again you know walking them through the journey what are the activities you're doing um, what is your product and that can really set you back at least three months um, if you get a, a new case handler um, but perhaps this is also a nice opportunity to segue a little bit into the kind of the questioning process, um, the interviewing. And I know, Lynn, you've, go th go, you've gone through a lot of these processes. Um, there are a lot of interviews. Um, of course, the MLRO interview is a very tough one. What are your experiences in terms of going through some of these interviews? Well, uh, the MLRO interview is a critical one uh, for the entire application um, to pass, actually. Um, so uh, I considered it to be a, a, a challenge session. So uh, almost one that you would uh, conduct a college level, university level cramming session for, if you will, to make sure you brush up on everything you might be questioned about. Um, I prepped a uh, minimum for two weeks beforehand to give you some idea. But uh, uh, my experience was more, most recently two hour formal session with uh, scheduled with four uh, supervisors, uh, members of the authorization team, plus specialists from the AML department at the FCA. And they will ask about everything. They can ask anything about any of the money laundering regulations, uh, discuss your tools. You have to be prepared to discuss uh, your sanctions screening. Um, and uh, how you would do reporting, for example. Uh, they also can ask anything about the firm and the products. So you really have to be prepared for the entire uh, application, if you will, and demonstrate that you understand fully the products of the firm and fully understand the risks and your risk assessment. But you definitely will be questioned on your risk assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are some really, really interesting points. And some of the themes that we have seen with some firms um, you know, take the MLRO interview, for example, of course, they're going to ask you about your your risk assessment, your um, your financial crime control framework, all of these things. And they will expect you to be on point on all of those questions. But they're also really pushing on other questions to, to do with the entire business. So really exploring whether or not the MLRO actually understands the, the, product, the product, the activities, do they understand the crypto landscape? Um, and they seem to be really interested in in questions around how the firm is going to kind of support a long term effective UK crypto ecosystem. So less they're less interested in you know another perhaps another crypto uh, retail exchange, and perhaps a little bit more interested in how your business is going to long term support a effective crypto ecosystem. And of course, the quest line of questioning then becomes a little bit more like perhaps your tier one bank questioning. You know, how what is your thoughts on the future of financial services, and what is your you know your thoughts on the future of crypto? Um, did you get any sense of that as well, Lynn? That the questions were kind of beyond the kind of MLRO AML framework type questions. Um, truthfully, because of my prior background working for a cryptocurrency exchange, I didn't get very much of that. But for people that have been in TradFi uh, only and taken up uh, a position uh, and they're fairly new to the crypto environment, they might expect a lot more of that. And I would just say that you have to do intensive reading on many, many crypto channels and make sure that you're very well plugged in to the ongoing daily changes and the developments and look at all the right channels, which a lot of your uh, colleagues will be able to help you with uh, to prepare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think to that point as well, we do sometimes see firms that, you know, purely for the perhaps they're, you know, haven't got too much in terms of funding, and they've made from a commercial decision to hire a slightly more junior MLRO, um, that will not help you get through the interview process. And again, coming back to this, getting the balance right between growing a practical business and being commercial, but you do need to make sure you have really strong expertise in those key roles that are going through the interview process. Otherwise, you're not going to get through these sort of question rounds. And have you got any thoughts on that, Lynn? 
Um, well, I'd say that <clears throat> also, you know, there are calls with the regulator during your Q&A process where you'll be involving your CEO or a chief operating officer as well. So those parties will, of course, need to be completely up to speed on the crypto landscape and future product developments and competitors. And so those questions can come in conversations uh, uh, throughout the Q&A process with your other corporate leaders. So <clears throat> don't think it's all just on the MLRO to demonstrate or compliance officer to demonstrate those uh, knowledge points, but the uh, MLR, uh, the uh, CEO and COO and other uh, lead tech uh, cybersecurity specialists, for example, uh, will need to also be woven into this process for you to give a complete picture of the firm and their knowledge. <laughs> That's a very good point as well. Um, and on the flip side, you know, of course, your CEO will also be asked questions about what are your financial crime risks um, and those kind of things. Lynn, how did you manage that internally in terms of managing those partners and stakeholders internally? Did you have to do a, maybe a little bit of financial crime training internally before these sessions? <clears throat> well, um, you know, uh, yes, there is financial crime training generally in most firms, and uh, that is a, another aspect. Your training program will be part of the uh, risk assessment under the MLRs. But um, <clears throat> generally, we uh, used our corporate in-house meetings that took place in our normal schedule. So the executive committee meetings, for example, meetings with the board would always include AML on the agenda. So we had this woven into our corporate fabric to begin with. So I didn't have so many challenges when I suddenly had to put them on a call with the FCA because we already were incorporating AML and issues and um, you know, uh, highlighting particular problems or uh, we rejected a customer for a certain reason related to AML. All that was already well known to the company leaders. Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps that's another really, really good point to raise is make sure you have a really quality governance structure. Um, yes. And yes. if you are, you know, an established entity, perhaps then looking to move across to the UK, that's where you perhaps have the um, the benefit because you hopefully have those strong governance structures already in place. But if you are a brand new startup looking to get into this space, making sure you do have those forums set up, even if you're friends and you're all founders and you're all having a great time, you do actually need to turn those into formal meetings to make sure you do cover all of the points um, as you're building up your business plan, as you're getting through this application process, you're building up your documentation. Your leadership yeah. needs to demonstrate that they are fully committed and following AML all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes. I, I love that. That's another good top tip. But I think, Mardi, you also wanted to jump in there as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, it sounds like the organization that Lynn was at was, uh, you know, the, the governance structure was really good compared to some of the, the fintech and some of the crypto providers that we work with. And so it, it is a case of, you know, making sure that you, you know, when you're really small and you're just two people with a great idea, you don't have to think about any of that stuff. So it's just making sure that as, as you grow and you do get those proper governance structures in place and you do, you know, kind of prioritize these things because, um, you know, if you don't have that in place, then you will come unstuck when you start to go through this registration process. Definitely. Could not agree more. It's a common theme, That's making sure you get those meetings and those structures in place. Um, Okay, so we've just gone through the registration process in quite a lot of detail. So again, to summarize, we've gone through the, the business plan, we've gone through the documentation, we've talked about top tips for interviewing and making sure you've got your governance in place. And ultimately, it's a long process. It's minimum of 12 months at the moment, and we are seeing a lot of challenges, but it is possible because I, I'm going to wrap up this, this section with the FCA did actually approve one firm a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was the first firm that got approved since October last year. So we've had a, a bit of a dry spell in terms of approvals through the registration journey, but we did see one and perhaps we, maybe we're starting into a little new tipping point. Let's see where the regulator is maybe aligning a little bit more with what the, the tone that's being set by the UK government. Will we see a few more approvals potentially? Um, we are, perhaps we are seeing that a little bit. And what we are seeing as well is the FCA trying to engage with the industry a little bit more. So that is positive. Um, any final thoughts, Lynn, before we move on to our top tip section? 
Okay, well, in terms of engaging with the industry in a positive light, uh, one really positive things the FCA has done, once you're over the fence, once you are registered, they have created a little uh, uh, new registered firm uh, uh, sort of holding pen or um, a training program. So for the first six months, a newly registered firm is going to get extra coaching from the new supervision uh, department that they are interacting with. So once you've made it over the hurdle, they're going to try and make it easier for you to implement your regulatory reporting, giving you coaching on that. You're going to have a little bit of extra time and attention from the supervisors. So they're going to try and make that easier. And they also have this new digital sandbox, which shows that they are committed to further innovation steps. So from that perspective, those are really great steps and we want to keep that going. But um, I believe that uh, people, again, through the industry association, uh, you know, informal channels, we're getting the feeling that they're going to be just continuing to approve a single digit number of firms per year, that it's going to be maintained as a very, very limited, very, very high standard of approval applied uh, on a continuing basis. So I don't necessarily see any dramatic change in the numbers coming out this year. So maybe we've got a little bit of positivity there from Lynn, but of course, uh, a little bit of realism at the end there that we're not going to see any any key spikes. Uh, the FCA will still be deploying a very high bar That's in terms standard. of the uh, yeah high standard when it comes to the registration process, and it will still be a challenge. Um, before we move then on to our final section on, we're going to wrap up with some top tips. We have had a few questions come in. Um, I'm going to focus more on the financial crime sort of parts of some of these, but um, I think, Mardi, you want to an uh, answer one of them. So are banks ready to open crypto current uh, and saving accounts? So are banks ready to open some of these? I think this maybe touches upon some of our points earlier around different banking partners and how they work with the industry. Have you got any thoughts on it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as you might expect, the, uh, you know, the kind of um, interest that you're seeing from the very big established traditional banks is is possibly slightly different from the kind of disruptive neo banks. I mean, I, th I think if we look back to when um, crypto first started to kind of um, in, enter into the regulated space or kind of enter into the sphere, and um, when you look at like when Coinbase were, were kind of making their initial offering into the UK. Um, the way that they actually structured things um, and the way that many of these kind of um, EMI providers rather than banks were offering their kind of crypto exchanges or offerings, they were actually doing it in two separate entities. Um, so they were having one regulated entity where they had their electronic money or payments permissions. And then they were having another separate but affiliated entity that offered their kind of digital currency or crypto wallets. And the reason that they were structuring their offering like that was because the, the regulator wanted to know that the, the regulated business was in a separate entity and therefore insulated from some of the crypto risk. So that's that's sort of a bit, and that's a bit of the history um, because I think, it, and the way I think it's relevant now is that the regulator still wants to know that the kind of traditional highly regulated businesses are not being put at risk, you know, by these kind of new crypto products. So I think the answer is banks are starting to look at this and especially the kind of neo banks um, who are disruptive and they're therefore, you know, really interested in these kind of like product developments. And like you said, they can, they can work with various partners in that space. They don't have to necessarily do everything themselves, but I think the kind of um, the very traditional banks are probably a bit slow to move on this because they are, you know, to get a full banking license, you're regulated, not just by the FCA, but also by the PRA. Um, and you would need to kind of a, a new product like this would need to be um, you know notified to both regulators and you would need to co kind of be able to provide them with a lot of reassurance to make sure that your sort of tradi more traditional regulated activities are not being put at risk so I think the answer is it's it's a process um, we are definitely seeing movement in that direction um, but I think whilst we're waiting for the full 
crypto authorization regime to come in, hopefully this year, subject to parliamentary time, um, there's still quite a lot of uncertainty. And so some of the really big established players don't want to kind of enter into that really uncertain market until they kind of know a bit more what the actual legislative, back, you know, kind of backdrop is going to be. Um, I think um, in a way that's unfortunate, but it also means I think there's a, a good opportunity for people who are um, interested and who do kind of want to product lead in this space. Yeah, I, I completely and utterly agree with you. Of course, um, the large traditional banks have a very different risk appetite for very different reasons that you've outlined. Uh, but we deal a lot with, you know, neobanks, etc. And they are really looking at their risk appetite, their risk assessments, how they can. And they're looking at how they can deal with these firms, not let's just stop it. So the, that's that's the difference. The main difference we're seeing on the ground for sure. We also have um, payment service providers in the EMI space that are offering just payment services with a card in both pounds, euros and dollars. So you can get these, your, your payment activities covered uh, as a crypto firm uh, without necessarily going to a traditional bank. So just think about that as another opportunity. I love this. It's very positive vibes towards the end of this session, um, giving people lots of options in a very challenging space. Um, okay, so let's wrap up then. We're going to, I'm going to go around the sort of the houses here and maybe just ask for maybe two three of your top tips each um so when firms are really looking to navigate through the uk crypto asset landscape um, perhaps mardi do you want to start us off what sure. top tips could you give so I've got three top tips. I think my first is don't assume that because you're not caught by one aspect of the regime that you're also not caught by another. Um, so I think there's a couple of examples here. If you're based overseas, you might, for example, be out of scope for AML registration, but you you know, you could be in scope of the financial promotions restriction. Um, NFTs are quite a tricky one because they don't appear to be a qualifying crypto asset in scope of the financial promotions regime. They might trigger the requirement to register for AML um, and it, it, they might fall within the wider definition of crypto asset that's set out in the um, regulated activities regime and that should hopefully be confirmed this year. Um, so don't assume that just because you're not caught or caught by one means that the same will apply across all of these kind of different um, different areas of the regimes. Um, I think my second top tip is make sure that you treat your consumers fairly. Um, this links back into what Lynn was saying right at the beginning of the session, where one of the reasons that the FCA has, you know, appeared to be quite crypto sceptic is because it's one of its main priorities is to protect consumers. Um, and we've seen this really recently as they've rolled out the consumer duty. Um, and, you know, they've always been interested in consumer protection, but they are especially interested in the crypto space. Um, make sure your terms and conditions are compliant with the Consumer Rights Act. Um, make sure your website and other marketing materials are fair, clear, not exceeding, contain the appropriate, appropriate disclaimers. Um, we are aware that the SEA have contacted some wallet providers where it thinks that their terms and conditions are unfair and it's um you know asked them to comment sent a bunch of information on undertakings and that kind of thing so don't just kind of think that you'll get away with it it's it's something that the FCA are paying attention to so it's worth doing from the beginning um, and then the third one is really just keep up to pace with the new developments I think um firms that do keep up to speed and um, there's so much opportunity here but um you know there's going to be development in this area this year. So it's important to kind of pay attention to the changes as, as they come. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Some excellent ones there. Yeah, definitely. Lynn, same for you. What sort of top tips do you have? Well, I've already uh, covered my first two. So moving to number three, um, you need to be focused on, uh, you're, you're really in an MLR plus re review process. Mm -hmm. So your financial projections and the financial resilience of your firm are going to be evaluated and it's yeah, it's more of a look sometimes for the smaller firms. So um, I think it's very important that you spend time on your financial projections. And as you mentioned just earlier, they need to be realistic and not a uh, pie in the sky or planning to be become, you know, go from zero to Mach 10 in two and a half years uh, because you're not, they're not going to believe that you're going to be able to, to scale 
effectively and maintain the risk control environment uh, at a very high standard that they're expecting if you're overly uh, optimistic in your projections. So uh, really work on those and make sure that they have a lot of integrity. Um, also, the consumer duty that Marty mentioned, um, you will need to go through a full risk assessment for consumer duty. And a lot of people are just completely missing that. So that goes into things like a fair value assessment for your partners, customer support monitoring, management MI, uh, customer outcome monitoring, root causes uh, for your uh, you know, processes and target market analysis. So it's a lot more work than it was a year ago. So we've got financial promotion plus consumer duty now layered in on top of a high standard for MLRs. So you really are going to have to add to your budget for your uh, you know, registration process because it's not just adding another compliance officer head. It's going to be adding a lot more in, in terms of the work that you need to do. Mm -hmm. So those are my tips. Mm -hmm. Just layering on the patchwork that we were talking layering about at the beginning. The yes. Um, and I suppose a couple from me then. We've already covered it. So make sure the business plan is sharp, well thought through and sensible, just as Lynn said. Make sure you really, really flesh out your um, risks. Your business risk assessment really needs to be good and clear. Um, and then, of course, the final one, making sure that you're prepared for your interviews. Or we're, we're figuring out our presentation here, but making sure that you are um, ready for your interviews. And I think Lynn gave some really good insights throughout the session today. So just to wrap up then, bang on time, uh, we've now got our presentation on here. So if you do want to um, get in touch with us, we've got our email addresses, but I think uh, LinkedIn is, is always really good. Um, reach out to us. We're always happy to have a conversation. I suppose the final, final point from me is just thank you very much to all of your insights and thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. Um, please do get in touch. If you have registered, of course, we'll be sending out to the recording of the webinar shortly, and I think it's going to go um, online. Uh, so yeah, please do follow us on LinkedIn, reach out, and hopefully we'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.